All right, hi. Sean Daniel, I'm going to talk about Scottish ales, which, uh, as you can see, BrewDog's a Scottish brewery, if you forgot, because they were very loud about it. So um, I want to bring up maps first, just because uh, I wanted you guys to get a little bit of an idea of the comparison. Um, when we talk about the UK, obviously Ireland's not part of it. Um, it includes Northern Ireland, Wales, England, and then Scotland at the very top. Also, to kind of get an idea of the geography, I put a comparison of the UK to California. So you can kind of see California is longer, taller than the UK actually is. So got to kind of get an idea of how close they are during this presentation. So when I was originally putting these slides together, it was kind of like I'm going to talk about pretty much four different beer styles for the BJCP, three of which are pretty much the exact same thing in different alcohol levels. Um, and then uh, as more I looked into it, the more I figured out there was actually more to talk about than just, you know, four beer styles, three of which are pretty much the same. Um, but I wanted to give you guys an idea in case you're not as familiar with Scottish ales, um, exactly what categories I'm talking about here. So um, category 14 for the BJCP guidelines is going to be uh, your Scottish Lights, Scottish Heavy, Scottish Export. This is different than the 2018, which was the uh, 60 shilling, 70 shilling, 80 shilling. And then the last one is the Wee Heavy, which is, I think most people are familiar with, a lot of breweries here uh, do some sort of Scotch Ale or Wee Heavy. All right, so uh, for beer history in Scotland, there actually wasn't much before the 18th century. Um, it was done, uh, ales were made from barley and meadow sweet, which I think was pretty common just about anywhere in Europe. Um, there is actually some sort of historical evidence that they had some sort of brewing. Um, and then uh, brewing was done by alewives or uh, monasteries, which I think was pretty common in Europe at the time as well. It was done at home. It was done kind of, you know, working on the farm uh, or a monastery, which, you know, monks were doing uh, to drink. Um, and then it wasn't until the 15th century that uh, the first commercial sales of beer were happening. And then um, the one thing to note is alcohol wasn't really part of the life in Scotland like it was especially in England where uh, people were actually, you know, drinking after work, um, you know, actually producing alcohol um, commercially especially. So uh, the 18th century is where things actually start changing for this. Um, so the, there were actually, so barley grows great in Scotland, um, but hops do not. And uh, just to kind of give you an idea of where Scotland is uh, latitude wise, uh, you're looking like the tip, the southern tip of Alaska and like halfway up Canada. So whereas like, what do we have? Washington, Oregon growing hops around here. That's more of equivalent to probably like I think London, um, Germany, I think goes a little further south than that. Um, so yeah, hops do not go great, grow great in uh, Scotland, but uh, barley does, does a really good job. And that's why a lot of, you know, that's I think why scotch became so popular there. They have a lot of alternatives or a, a lot of options for barley. Um, so um, interesting thing that happened was, uh, you know, Scotland and England became the U UK in uh, 1707, um, but 10 years before that um, is actually when there was a tax put on malt in England, so Scotland actually avoided that. So they could actually create beer without all the taxes from the government. Um, and so this is actually the reason why they started adding more hops to English beers to make them interesting, is because it was actually costing them more to make maltier beers, higher alcohol beers than it was to actually add hops into beers. Um, and then pretty soon, um, after the Scottish realized that they could take advantage of this and import their beers to, to England, um, alewives uh, stopped brewing beer because men started doing it as a profession. It became commercially available or a commercial product. And uh, one thing to keep in mind during this whole time, and it actually every time I look this up, it looks like Scotland's population is about the 10th of the size of England's. So the more beer that they produced, the more they just wanted to export because they didn't have enough actual population to drink it at the time. Um, and so by 1800, the number of breweries in Scotland had actually tripled to over 150. So, um, oh, yeah. Uh, uh, I hate to interrupt, but I was wondering what we're drinking. 
Oh, thank you. <laughs> Didn't even realize you guys support it. Um, so, oh, that, that's one thing I, I don't know if you could hear the discussion over here and the people online can't. So um, we're going to, I'm going to talk about the beers. Um, I'll, I'll say what it, they are and everything, but since I'm going to go into the beers towards the end, I'm going to have them pour throughout. That way you guys aren't just getting a whole bunch of beers all at the end. Um, so this is going to be your Scottish Light. This is actually a homebrew recipe. Um, and I'll go over the slide here pretty soon that goes over that recipe. But just so you guys kind of get an idea of what we're drinking. Thank you. Oh, thanks for the pour. Okay. So uh, eventually, because it was commercialized, um, and they, Scotland didn't have as many brewers, they realized they could just start hiring brewers from England and bring them across the border. So... <clears throat> um, they actually were creating a lot of these English styles because the brewers from England were coming over to create them. Um, and again, they're selling them back to England. They're actually importing them uh, to the US, uh, a lot of different areas. They were bringing them over by boat. Um, and during that, uh, I think, so they were actually importing a lot of their brewing ingredients as well from the US during this time. Um, so. By 1840, they had 280 different breweries. Um, they started getting into lager brewing after they saw how popular the German Pilsner was doing. And uh, it was in 1888, Tennant, one of the top breweries at the time, actually brewed, or built a brewery dedicated to only brewing lagers, which I couldn't actually find a picture of, but I think it actually still exists. They're just, they've moved around the, the breweries that's done lagers quite a few times. Um, and during this, uh, because they were kind of trying to expand their menu options to a lot of, you know, to the appeal of consumers, they uh, kind of experimented with how they could get away with making cheap beers um, with, you know, as, as many options as possible. So they were, since hops were kind of hard to get in Scotland, they started brewing with spent hops. They would uh, do a party guile brewing system. They would often add, like, darker malt to, you know, make, like, milk stouts. Um, porters, stuff like that, and then since they're lower hopped rate, they could just pretty much reuse, grab all the hops out of there, throw it in the next batch. And so here's kind of just a quick slide example to uh, show you uh, what kind of beers were actually available pretty much in the early 1900s. I mean, for what we know, for per the style guidelines, you don't often see like any of this really mentioned that Scotland had a bunch of different beers at one point. And uh, so, just to kind of go over some, I guess, characteristics that Scottish beers had, uh, just because it was interesting looking at the different uh, records that they've been able to find. So it looks like uh, they were able to control fermentation temperatures around this time, and they were actually able to premature, pre prematurely stop the fermentation. Um, so this might be why it's kind of thought that a lot of Scottish beers would actually have uh, diacetyl in it um, because they're actually stopping the fermentation to drop out the yeast. Um, but for whatever reason, it's gone on record that Scottish, the, the, you know, the lower ABV beers that they were drinking in Scotland, they wanted that. They wanted like that sweetness, you know, extra character to it, lower ABV. So um, they would start brewing batches and the attenuation would just drop to ridiculous numbers. Um, so sweet stouts, less than 2% ABV have been recorded. And I mean, they, they stopped fermentation what seemed like, you know, a day later after it had started fermenting. I mean, these things were super thick. Um, another comments here is, uh, so they would add hops because especially a lot of it is gonna be uh, exported. So they were gonna add it depending on how long it was gonna age. And so that's why I like Scotch ales have a lot more hops in them, um, although we'll get a little bit more on those, that style here in a little bit. But they did a lot of IPAs. A lot of those IPAs that they were making there had the exact same hopping rates as their English counterparts. Um, and then uh, another thing was the yeast that they used there. Pretty much on record to say there wasn't any unique yeast. Um, they were all pretty much sharing the same yeast throughout the different breweries. And then so these BJCP guiles, uh, style guidelines, what are they actually based off of? And we'll go with, uh, so it's, they're based off of what post-World War II to 1970s beer in Scotland was like. 
And then so this is Ron Pattinson, which uh, I think uh, Derek's brought him up a couple times in his presentations. And uh, I mean, he does everything pretty much European beers, but he's done a lot on, uh, like a lot of information from this actually came from um, his blog, uh, Shut Up About Barclay Perkins. So uh, I think everyone's probably knows, knows by now, uh, don't add smoked malts <laughs> to, to these beers. Um, it's 28 or 2008 BJCP guidelines say it's okay. And I think it's widely accepted now that it's not. Um, so a lot of people say, oh, th they're going to have low hopping rates, um, which is true for the styles that they have for BJCP, but it's not true historically. They, they did like their hops. They still added them, um, especially for their export beers. Um, long boils for added caramelization. This probably was true at one point, but there's not very many breweries that ever did that. that that ever did that, and it definitely is uh, not common these days. Um, there is, so, well, I'll, I'll get into it in a second. I was going to say, so uh, Jamil Zanishev, when he wrote the book, um, is it the Classic Styles? Uh, he had a recipe in there that would talked about doing like a caramelization, taking like a gallon of it, boiling it down, re-adding it for color. Um, actually emailed him about that to ask, like, hey, was this actually... You know, wh where's your evidence for this? Because in the new BJCP style guidelines, it says, do not do that. It's not historically accurate. He kind of came back and said, well, you know, it depends on who you ask. But um, there's, they, they really liked their specialty malts, especially during that time, especially, you know, with English, getting influenced by English breweries. Um, I'm pretty sure that the caramelization's not, you know, within like the last century. Um, and then fermented like lagers, that's how they thought that they were, the Scottish breweries were actually getting this lower ABV um, and low attenuation is uh, the yeast is going to go slowly. If it's fermented colder, they figured, oh, well, Scotland's actually, you know, further north, so it's got to be colder there, so maybe they're fermenting colder. But around this whole time, they already had controlled fermentation, so none of that was actually true. Um, they, they ferment at normal temperatures. Um, and then, oh, there was... Uh, so originally, uh, they, they had to fix it for the 2015, but um, they used to call them the 60, 70, 80 shillings. And uh, that isn't so accurate because it's more the price, and you could use that for anything. So like they say here, there were 54 shilling stouts, 86 shilling IPAs. I was going to say, we can probably start passing around that second beer now, too. That's getting to that point. Um, so that's not, you know, at, at least they fixed it in that guidelines. And that was one of uh, Ron Pattinson's big beefs with the, the BJ, BJCP guidelines. So um, Scottish Light, that's what you're br drinking right now. Uh, the beer was likely designed after the English Mild. Um, so when you're looking through the guidelines, you'll see this beer actually is darker. So I kind of put a comparison up there. The Scottish Light SRM is 17 to 22. Um, Oh, so a comparison, you can see 13 to 22 is what uh, you're allowed for the heavy and export. So they can end at the same range, but heavy and export can be lighter. And then 12 to 25 for a dark mild. Um, most breweries will add caramel coloring to actually get that uh, darker color on there. Um, and if you look at the, oh, do you have a question, Lou? The, so was it designated as a 60 shilling for the um, Mickey wins? Wait. <laughs> so, okay. Uh, so that's, I guess, to clarify the question. So uh, Lou's asking if, uh, if this is called 60 shilling, why did it say not to do the 60 shilling before? Although he's getting beer now. Okay. So the, the reason behind that is um, that's Mickey wins 60 shilling. So if you went to the bar at McEwen's, that's what they would actually like serve you. So that's going to be that one beer that's going to be that price. So, but you know, you could go somewhere else, they would have a 60 shilling, you get a pour of it, and it's a pale ale. So that's, although that's kind of like a weird example, I guess, <laughs> when you bring it up like that. Oh, yeah, and I'm sure they've gone up in price. 
<laughs> yeah, or <laughs> decreased in alcohol percentage. What are you going to say, David? What was the what? Oh, okay, so Scottish Light was uh, the first beer that was brought around, and Scottish Export's going to be the second beer. Mm -hmm. It's the one on Nitro, which I was trying to avoid buying it on Nitro, but that's, that's all they sold it in the pack. Um, okay. And then, so here, we can go over the first beer that you guys drank. So this is a uh, Jamil Scottish Light recipe. Um, I added Carafa. So remember that this book came out, I think, in 2011. So BJCP guidelines have been updated since. Uh, his recipe is pretty complex, especially with base malts. For this, I would, if you're going to rebrew this recipe, adjust the uh, UK pale malt with whatever your um, efficiency is going to be. Uh, otherwise, you're probably going to go over. Um, but I mean, I, so I did a, for notes on this, I tried to mash it 158. I think I roughly hit 158. Um, I decided to cut it early. So I did a 30 minute mash to help, uh, it from attenuating too low, kind of stop the, uh, the conversion on that. I would definitely recommend that if you're going to try to do it because you'll easily, so I got 10, 13 as the final gravity, which I was actually surprised I got because I thought I was going to hit 10, 11 or lower, and that would have put me way over the 3.2%, I think, that it's allowed for the style. Yeah, 3.2. So if you're going to brew this beer, just be really careful. Yeah. So no, it, uh, the question was the recipe doesn't use Scottish yeast. Uh, no, this one um, is definitely the California ale yeast. I do have a slide coming up on the Scottish ale yeast. Um, so the next two styles, they're pretty much the exact same thing. Um, you, are this, so you're drinking um, Bellhaven, yeah. So uh, these two styles are going to be based on an English pale ale, which uh, is a s strong bitter, I guess, for BJCP styles. Um, did I have? The, I don't remember if I had a comparison. I don't think I had a comparison slide for those two styles on here, but. Um, Still, so the Scottish export's probably closer to what that's going to be. Um, I think there's a few differences. The bitterness is a little bit lower. Um, but otherwise, color is pretty spot on. ABV is pretty spot on. Again, um, for whatever reason, the Scottish beers, they're going to have that lower or higher, atten no, lower attenuation, so higher finishing gravity. So the ABVs are going to be the same, but you'll notice that they actually allow for a little bit more wiggle room in between there by having a higher starting gravity. And then, so this second beer you're drinking right now, which is the Scottish Export. Um, again, I'm sorry, it's on Nitro. I was trying to find it without. It seems like Bell ha Bellhaven's beers that they send here are pretty much all on Nitro these days. Um, so they're just using, uh, this is from the website, by the way. So pale crystal malt and black malt. Um, and Challenger and Goldings. I don't really get too much hops from this beer, but it's been brought over, so <laughs> it's probably a little older. Uh, so, yeah, we'll go over Scottish styles uh, for recipe development. Um, because there's a lot of specialty malts in these, uh, was it Designing Great Beers by Ray Daniels? Although the book came out in 1996, it's actually very helpful to go over kind of what the different breweries have. And then one thing I'll say about this slide is it includes, so the whole section includes Scottish ales and Scotch ales. Um, there could be some Scotch ales that are actually included in this. But for the most part, besides the ABV difference, they're pretty much similar malts from what it looks like for a lot of different breweries I was able to look up and see the recipe on. So yeah, a lot of black malt or roasted barley uh, with some crystal. Um, they don't go too, too crazy on any of the other malts that are available. And then so just to kind of go over the topic of malt real quick, uh, I'm sure when I say British Pale Ale, I'm not actually talking about Golden Promise. Um, a lot of people probably would think, okay, well, I'm going to make a Scotch or a Scottish beer. I'm going to put Golden Promise in it because it's a Scottish malt. Um, luckily, I found a Brewlosophy experiment to kind of see what, you know, the recipe would be for this or uh, to see if there's a difference between the two for a recipe. 
and uh, I was able to find an experiment that had uh, Golden Promise um, against British Pale Ale. I think there were there's a little over half that were able to uh, determine the difference, but it wasn't enough because you're handed three cups, so you'd have to have over two thirds um, to find out if there's an actual difference over you know random choice. So uh, the beer that they brewed was just a lower than 4% ABV single malt beer. Um, you can kind of see, I don't know how well you can see the picture, but uh, the Golden Promise beer actually cleared up quite a bit more than the uh, uh, Pale Ale malt, but you can see the Pale Ale malt actually has a nice foamier head. I don't know if that's just because of the way that it was poured, but um, it looks a little bit more, looks a little better to me. Um, oh, but regardless of which malt you actually choose on this, just remember you're going to be probably adding specialty malts. So if you can't really taste a huge difference and you know it's only going to make up maybe like 60 to 70% of your recipe and you're going to have stronger flavors in there, I guess go with whichever's going to be cheaper. Um, so for hops, almost all the styles say low to none. Um, it's mostly added for bitterness, just use an English variety. Uh, so this is where the yeast is going to come in. So when y you have a lot of people, especially in the U.S., judging these beers, if you're making this for a competition, you probably want to just go with Cal Ale for your Scottish ales, um, not including like the Wee Heavy. Um, that's only because if you add more flavors in there, it's going to be more, you know, it's going to be confusing, I guess, for the judge, especially if you're getting fruity esters. They're going to kind of clash a little bit with, you know, like a malty or toffee note. Uh, and using Cal Ale, you're probably less likely to get uh, diacetyl, um, which in my opinion, just pretty much is going to bring down a beer regardless. Even if it says it's acceptable, someone's going to say it's too strong of a, a note for that, and you're going to be better off just, just without it. So I recommend Cal Ale. That's what Jamil would say for all of his beers. Um, and, yeah, it's, it's probably more likely what, what they were actually having at the time, especially if they were sharing yeast together. They were probably getting a faster attenuated yeast that, uh, or a faster fermenting yeast um, that kind of – changed over time to just be cleaner because um, you're going to dump the beers that don't taste right. So, and then um, for Wee Heavy, uh, that's where you can go with that Scottish Ale Yeast, um, which is uh, WLP 028 and Y Yeast 1728. Um, when I looked it up, it's believed to be McEwen strain. They do make a Scotch Ale. That I think they make a couple different Scotch Ales or Wee Heavies. So... You can't say just because, well, I saw the Scottish Ale up there, so that must be the yeast they use for that um, to get that flavor. You know, they, they do a lot of wee heavies as well. Um, and then, oh, one other interesting thing is, so the beer that I actually gave you guys, I used a higher sulfate ratio um, compared to chloride uh, just to give it a little bit more crispness. Uh, I looked this up. Most people said that they've won competitions with either profile when uh, you know, people were asking, hey, what kind of water profile should I do for a Scottish style beer. I mean, even as uh, we heavy, um, people were saying you you could use sulfate, you know, even though it's a little bit sweeter of a, a beer, but it just gives it a little bit crisper of a bite. Um, I guess it really depends. You could go for a balanced profile. I think any of them are really going to be fine. It's going to be up to the, the judge to probably be picky if you're entering it into a competition. And if you're not, then do whichever you like. You know, they're, they're um, malt heavier beers, so just if you like that sweeter flavor, go for it. Uh, and then we can get into the, oh, we can uh, do the next beer now. Hopefully I'm not going to be rushing you guys too much. Okay. Oh. Let's see. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right. So the next beer that's going to be coming around is going to be the Wee Heavy. Um, so these were first brewed in the 1700s. Um, so they were actually originally brewed to compete with English barley wines. The Scottish wanted their own version of them, especially for export, um, which is mostly exported. And then, um, so an interesting thing is after a while in, in the UK, kind of people's preferences for beers actually changed. They wanted something paler. And... So the one way to appeal to the English audience, consumer, was to uh, actually lighten up their scotch ales or their uh, wee heavies. So they actually did shorter boils on them to achieve this, which the English 
were still making their darker items, and people actually preferred the the lighter colored beers. So they kind of went with it, and um, it appealed for a while. Now, obviously, uh, it's probably the most common Scottish style style you would see here in San Diego, um, brewed you know at craft breweries, and uh, especially around the U.S. Uh, they're all much darker in color. They're probably more based off of what the BJCP styles would say. I think it's what brewers are mostly used to. Um, so here's kind of a comparison of what the difference between BJCP guidelines for the Wee Heavy and the English Barley Wine. So you can see they have a higher OG a little bit for that lower or uh, not as high attenuation. Um, IBU-wise, again, there's a huge difference on that. Um, but as you can see, English barley wines are now acceptable to be lighter in color, whereas the, the wee heavies are actually lower. And then so just kind of go over recipe development. Again, this is from Ray Daniels' book. Um, oh, actually, this is Ray Daniels' book, which he go went over a lot of the winners for that, I think that went to second round. But again, this is back in 1996. Um, but I also looked up on uh, the AHA's website to kind of get an idea of what beers or what we heavies were actually winning um, competitions, which to be honest, for what's recorded on the website, there's only, I think, three that have ever won that cat like the categories that they've been in. So if you guys are actually doing this for NHC, um, I make a really good one or try to do a different style beer in that category. I think it's a less common style, so maybe a lot of judges aren't as used to it. I think, oh my God. <laughs> um, so anyway, to go with this, um, the BJCP guidelines really just say you can use pale malt with some roasted barley, um, and it's optional to use crystal and caramel malt. Um, Jamil's recipe is really just a built up version of what his Scottish ale recipes are. So he's got that Munich, that crystal, he even put the honey malt back in there and the pale chocolate. Um, so for the BJCP medal winners, their specialty malts, they uh, went, I think almost, yeah, almost all the recipes had some sort of version of Munich, uh, caramel, roasted barley malt. Um, but then there were a few that had wheat, melanoidin, biscuit, brown, and aromatic. And then again, don't use smoked malt. There we go. Okay, so this is the third beer that you're drinking, which is a uh, Traquere. I was glad I didn't have to pronounce too many things here because I don't think I'd be able to do that too well. Um, so they don't go over a lot of uh, what the recipe is for this beer. Um, so Designing Great Beers, Ray Daniels had an actual page that talked about this, or well, the brewery itself, and they did go over the We Heavy, and he said it was only pale malts and black malts. I don't know if they've changed the recipe since. I feel like they're a very traditional brewery, so they probably haven't. Um, but, I mean, yeah, it could just be real basic of a recipe for this. Um, okay, so we'll continue on with the history from here. And the uh, being a wee heavy at what was it seven two is that fairly low? Oh, seven point. I think it was uh, uh, six and a half, actually. Okay. Yeah. It's, so when you went with the shilling scale for wee heavies, they actually jumped. So what is it? The sixty, the sixty, seventy, eighty. I don't remember what the original BJCP was, uh, think about it. But I think We Heavy was anything like 90 and higher. So it was kind of almost like one step up from that, which I think the, I don't know if I can go back too far. But yeah, so Scottish Export ends at six. So yeah, it, it really was just one more step up and they've, they've kept with that. Um, I don't, I was going to say, if you're going to, I feel like everyone who brews a wee heavy is going to go way over than six, six and a half percent. <laughs> yeah, so it goes, it goes up to 10. So that's yeah. I'd be interested to see like what, uh, I know there are like, like Saison, for instance, has like a huge range, but I'm curious what beers have wide ranges like that, that um, you can really go anywhere with it. 
So um, going back to the history, so I, uh, it was, so you can see right there, 1910, uh, we, there were 92 breweries in Scotland. There started to be a decline. Um, this was due to uh, World War I, World War II, uh, kind of had a resource issue and they couldn't really import, export a lot. Um, and I think you know, a lot of the grains were probably going to other places. Um, so back by 1970s, there were only 11 breweries in Scotland. Um, this also, there were a lot of mergers, and then a lot of those mergers went under afterwards. So a lot of the popular breweries, and this is actually why it's really hard to find a lot of history on these breweries, because so many have actually gone away. Um, so there's not a lot of records. And uh, I was actually looking it up earlier today, or yesterday. Um, I think it was, I saw an interesting thing that Bellhaven is actually the only large brewery in Scotland that's actually still in Scotland. A lot of the other breweries that are still around that have, uh, like they've been bought by other companies, they're no longer owned by an actual Scottish brand. Um, so I actually should have put 2010s down below. But um, so Scotland's actually seen a rise to this. And then I guess we can, Pass around that next beer. I know I'm rushing you guys through beers. I feel like, <laughs> but we we can do the next beer. Um, so actually, there's been a craft beer revival going along in Scotland. So by 2010, there were actually 50 breweries. So they were on the way up. Um, and I want to say this actually could be partially because of Brewdog, um, just as kind of an inspiration. I'm sure most of you have been drinking beer for the last probably decade. Remember. I mean, they were all over the U.S. for a while. They started the TV show. They did a lot of stuff, collaborations with Stone. Um, I think the next, oh, yeah, yeah. So we had 115 breweries in Scotland. 80% of those are actually microbreweries. Um, and I think this is, so even the larger breweries and older breweries are trying to appeal to the craft beer audience. So Trequare actually has Spring Hills now. Bellhaven, if you go there. Um, on tap, they actually have a bunch of craft beers now. It's not just your standard, what you would expect uh, beer-wise. And actually, so I thought I had to slide for this, but I didn't. So I don't know if you guys remember, but BrewDog actually had a, I think I wrote it down. That's, wh that's what I did. So you guys remember when BrewDog kind of was trying to, like, change the world of craft beer? <laughs> so they, they were originally, uh, they were founded in 2007. Um, they decided to kind of go against... Uh, do I have what the name of the? No, I don't. Uh, so I guess like their alcohol, the, whoever the alcohol allowance group is or whatever, like we have the TTB um, here in the U.S. Thank you. Um, so they actually decided that they were marketing too aggressively over in Scotland. So they decided, they, they threatened to ban them. So they decided to come out with a beer called Speedball to see how that would go over. Of course, it gets banned. They eventually uh, called it Dogma. Um, so I think, I haven't seen that beer in a while, but I think they were brewing it for a while. And then they decided to see how high they could make, you know, the, the ABV on beers. So in 2009, they released Tokyo, which was 18.2%. Then they went with Tactical Nuclear Penguin, which is 32%. And then in 2010, they had Sink the Bismarck, which went up to 45%. And then the Squirrel Taxidermy beer that I had at the very beginning, that was called the end of history, and it went up to 55%, which I think was a freeze-distilled. Uh, I don't remember what style of beer that is. And it's not going to say it on the bottle because the bottle's a squirrel. But uh, Sink the Bismarck is actually an IPA, the 41% IPA, however that works. Um, but actually, one interesting thing, too, is uh, you know, we haven't seen them in the U.S. in a while. They've actually started moving into seltzers, ciders, non-alcoholic beers. Uh, they, they've kind of really changed around, which reminds me a lot, I feel like, of Stone here. Um, they started entering the seltzer game. They were kind of doing, I think, the same aggressive marketing that they had before, or that they had that was similar to, to BrewDog. And, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. So that's what I was going to say. So they're not, they're, not distribu they're not doing distribution here, which I think, I want to say Stone might have originally helped them with distribution in California. But um, yeah, they, they still have breweries on the East Coast and uh, Midwest. Oh, really? Where would you say that was at? Oh, okay. Columbus, Ohio has a massive brewery from BrewDog for, for those who couldn't hear. <laughs> nice. 
Oh, yeah, yeah, I did see. So they have their own hotels as well, um, which I didn't look too much into, but I thought it was interesting. Oh. The, which one? Oh, yeah, 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 they, they still make beer now. Yeah. Uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> I got to repeat. So Mickey wins, if they're still around today, um, the, the brewery that had the original Scottish Ale Easter that, that w, or, uh, White Labs and uh, White East have been using. Yes, they're, they're still around today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They were, they were around before 1970. They're alive today. Um, they, I don't think they... You might be able to find a few of their other beers here, but the 60 shilling, uh, as far as I know, it's not sold in the U.S. Oh, <laughs> okay. And then, so this is the last beer that I brought for you guys, just to kind of round it out with something that's not going to be in the BJCP guidelines. Um, I didn't have too many options <laughs> trying to find other Scottish beers that would be an interesting style. Uh, but Balehaven's Black is pretty much everywhere. Um, really, I haven't actually tried it yet, but I imagine it tastes very similar to an uh, uh, Irish stout. Or dry stout. Um, but yeah, it uses pale chocolate, crystal roasted barley, Challenger, which they use in another beer, and then um, also 4.2%, so I guess a nice little fresh one to, to finish on. Um, and then I wanted to go over, and this will kind of tie in, which was unexpected, uh, to our um, raffle. But um, if you guys are actually interested, so there actually are a lot of beers that I didn't serve here today. They're available at Holiday Wine Cellar. Um, definitely recommend trying them out. I couldn't find a whole lot of beers otherwise. Tried BevMo. Uh, we even went to Total Wine uh, when I was out of the, the city to see if I could find anything. Um, but, I mean, Holiday Wine Cellar does have a lot of options. And uh, I definitely recommend uh, going there and trying it. And house ale, I, I thought I wasn't even going to be able to find the house ale, but luckily they had it available. And then, yeah, I mean, unless there's any questions from this. Any questions? We can move into the raffle. Yep. Oh, so the question is if uh, I'm talking about with the pale ale malts, if it's uh, Maris Otter or if it's... Um, um, British Pale Ale. So th there is a British Pale Ale malt, yeah. It's separate from Maris Otter. I think th there was supposed to be a comparison, I think, from Brewlosophy where they were going to try to do, I think, Golden Promise and Maris Otter. But I think Maris Otter is just a slightly darker in color. So the British Pale is still, like, darker than American Pale Malt, but um, just by, like, half a Levabon, maybe a full Levabon. Any other questions? Thank you, Sean. Patrick, any questions? <laughs>